I'm going to get the electronics up and running here. And while I'm doing that, let me first of all say, if you are over here, the slides are over there. So I think there's some things you might miss. Um, you never know what the setup of these rooms is going to be. So I do have some slides that are text heavy, but not many. It's mostly pictures. So if you're over there, you probably won't be able to see the pictures well. I apologize for that. Um, second disclaimer is um, the comments that I'm making here today, I'm making on my own behalf as uh, an independent scholar, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, and so anything I say is my views, not theirs. Um, let me also say thanks to Ken for putting this uh, conference together. I think it's a great topic. I think there are some really great sessions in store, and I look forward to uh, be part, being part of this with all of you. And to Nancy for running the logistics back there behind the um, window. I've appreciated uh, her help in getting ready for this. Um, so despite the title of the talk, I should say um, I'm really not going to talk about Galileo at all, but I am going to talk about what I'm calling Galileo moments, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, the talk's really uh, split up in two halves. So the first half is really just storytelling, um, and the second half will get to something more substantive. Um, so bear with me. I hope that you find the storytelling part informative as we... Uh, think about these important topics at the intersection of science and faith. So the time is, the year is 1245, and the location uh, is a dirt road somewhere between Cologne and Paris. And on this road are two Dominican friars who've been dispatched to Paris, to the University of Paris in particular, by the Dominican Order, which had just recently concluded its meetings uh, in Cologne. Now, at this particular time, the University of Paris was the leading educational institution in the Western world, the Harvard of the 13th century. And students from across Europe were flocking to Paris to learn from the brightest minds. And like all centers of ac academic excellence, it seems at least, bright minds wanted to push boundaries and challenge orthodoxies. And one historian described the situation in Paris at this time with these words, the very importance of the university to which professors and students flocked from all parts of the world became the occasion of many disorders. For where there were so many gathered together, fired with ambition and enjoying the privileges which were lavished on teachers and students, it was but natural for youth to become relaxed and for the professors to become haughty, ambitious, and anxious to acquire a great name by upsetting old theories and introducing new doctrine. So the relatively young University of Paris at that point had nonetheless graduated many high-ranking members of European uh, society, including the Pope at that time, Pope Innocent III. And because of its stature, the King of France had granted the university a number of really unusual powers. So for example, it was allowed to uh, operate under ecclesiastical authority to such an extent that civil authorities were not allowed to arrest students or faculty for things that they had done. They could only be detained and then turned over to the university for trial in a uh, church court. And in part for that reason, students tended to run wild on campus and around the city. Uh, this was in part made worse by the fact that they would oftentimes enroll when they were only 13 or 14 years of age. And they would sometimes stay in the university for six to 12 years. So you can see sometimes things don't change very much. Uh, so they stay kind of the same. Um, the Dominican order knew the brilliance and power and influence of Paris and that it wasn't to be underestimated. And they realized that future generations of leadership in the church and in the culture were likely to pass through the halls of Paris. So to surrender Paris to heterodox intellectuals for the church would have been a major setback for a church that was already facing a number of challenges. And so something needed to be done to restore um, order, intellectual order and faithful orthodoxy to what was going on at Paris. That was the view of the church. So, but what was the problem exactly? What was the problem they were trying to confront? And uh, there were a number of them, but one of them arose from the fact that roughly 300 years before the time of our friar's journey, um, the Muslim Umayyad dynasty had roared across the Straits of Gibraltar and was really threatening to topple all of, all of Europe. But after a century 
poised at the French border there, <clears throat> the Cordoban Cal Caliphate fractured into a number of different kingdoms, which were progressively conquered until the fall of Cordova and then Seville. And that occurred just around the time that our friar's journey was about to begin. Um, but the declining influence of uh, Muslim political power corresponded with a rise of Islamic ideas. So less than 50 years before our friar's journey in 1198, the Muslim philosopher of Aroes, pictured here, and just take a look at that picture because I'll come back to it later. Um, that's of Aroes looking like he's listening to a boring science and religion lecture, but it, he's actually uh, adopting that pose for another reason. Um, so what Averroes had done in 1198 was to write the most potent articulation and apologetic defense of Islam within the Western world. And in these works, what he does is he deploys the philosophical framework of Aristotle combined with the sacred teachings of Islam to provide what he thought was a comprehensive and persuasive account of nature, philosophy, and theology. So had the ideas of Averroes just remained in the Iberian Peninsula, that would have been, wouldn't have been a problem. But in fact, in the 12th and 13th century, Latin translations of Averroes' works and what we might call the patron philosopher of Islam, so as it was thought at that time, Aristotle, were flooding over the border and making their way straight into the hands of Parisian intellectual elites. So not surprisingly, this was worrisome to the church, not only because they worried that perhaps the apologetic force of Averroes' arguments might lead, convince readers to convert to Islam, but they also worried that even if they weren't converted to Islam, they might be converted to certain heterodox conclusions that uh, Averroes thought followed from Aristotle's thought. And there were a number of these, but here are just a few of them just to give you a sample. So first of all, it seemed that the um, theological implications of Aristotle's thought as understood by Averroes entailed that there was no personal immortality that individuals couldn't persist past the time of their bodily death, at least as individuals. And so that was certainly a troubling conclusion for monotheists, um, certainly for Christians, but for Muslims as well. Uh, Aristotle's views seemed to entail the eternity of the universe, that is, the universe wasn't created at a particular point in the finite past, which again seemed in tension with the doctrines of both Christianity and Islam. Um, in addition, it seemed to follow from Aristotle's view that God couldn't know facts about particulars, about particular events in the creation, in the past, present, or in the future. And all these things seem to be in tension with Christian and Muslim doctrines of providence. So these are some really troubling claims that seem to follow from Aristotle's views as they were incorporated into um, the Averroistic picture. And many Islamic thinkers recognize the theological challenges associated with this. So uh, some Islamic thinkers who preceded Averroes realized that these conclusions followed from Aristotle's thought, and they scolded some of their Muslim peers for following this Aristotelian line of thinking. So the famous 12th century Persian Muslim scholar Al-Ghazali um, took these views to task in a book with the no-nonsense title, uh, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. And of course, Averroes comes along a few years later and writes his reply, The Incoherence of the Incoherence. Um, so the battle continues between these different schools. Um, but recognizing the problematic conclusions that seem to follow from Aristotle-inspired philosophy, you might say even Averroes, to some extent, throws up his hands. He recognizes the heterodox conclusions of these uh, philosophical arguments and endorses something that later philosophers go on to be called the two-truth theory, according to which some claims are true theologically, but their denial is true philosophically. So he recognizes the heterodox nature of the philosophical conclusions, but wanting to hang on to the theological conclusions seems to adopt the position that you can hold both of them, despite the fact that they're in tension with one another. So um, not surprisingly, not a few Muslims were unsatisfied with this solution. I mentioned Ghazali earlier. And um, it seemed to them, of course, that what it looked like they were trying to demonstrate, people like Averroes were trying to demonstrate, was that you could reason from these first principles to conclusions that were supposed to be indubitable, but which were heterodox 
in nature, and many Muslims rebelled against that notion. Um, and now, with this sort of a veroistic picture gaining in popularity, there was a risk, of course, that Christian thinkers would begin to reason in the same way, that they too would begin to adopt something like this two-truth intellectual schizophrenia, and uh, that was troubling to church authorities. So the church took some measures, stopgap measures, it turns out, to try to prevent the spread of Aristotle and Islam in um, the Christian West. So in 1210, an assemblage of bishops here at the cathedral at San issued a condemnation of the works of Aristotle, and it included a ban on teaching the works of Aristotle at Paris. Part of the condemnation read as follows, neither the books of Aristotle on natural philosophy or their commentaries are to be read at Paris in public or secret, and this we forbid under penalty of excommunication. Now, uh, interestingly, other universities in the region decided to capitalize on this ban in Paris by advertising that they were places where you could hear the books of Aristotle, which were forbidden at Paris. Um, I found that it was, this was a very successful tactic for getting students to read a book was to tell them that it was forbidden. Um, when I, this is really true, when I first taught a science and religion course at Franklin and Marshall, it was just after Michael Behe's um, Darwin's Black Box had come out. And, um, and it created some controversy amongst the faculty at Franklin and Marshall. And a number of them told me, one, well, one told me in particular to quote, our students shouldn't be allowed to read that book. Well, I told the students that on the first day. We weren't even supposed to read it until a month into the class, and they came back at the end of the first week, they'd all read the book. So note to the Catholic Church, this tactic tends not to work. Um, <clears throat> so who were these intellectual mercenaries on the road to Paris? They were these two men, Albert the Great and his brilliant 20-year-old student, Thomas Aquinas. Now, no one actually knows what Albert and Thomas talked about on their 325-mile journey on the dirt road from Cologne to Paris. But it seems likely, given the charge that they had received from the Dominican church, that they were strategizing about how to reverse the unorthodox trends that had taken hold at Paris. Um, the books of Aristotle had been banned. They knew that. The books were still being read and even taught in the classroom, and they, and they knew that. So what to do? Well, the easiest route here would have been to try to re-embrace the philosophical system of Plato, the system on which Augustine had built his theological and philosophical edifice, and to try to enforce that sort of thinking in Paris. That would have been the fastest way to kind of shut down these heterodox uh, directions of thought and to restore orthodoxy. But as many of you know, that wasn't the, that wasn't the path that they followed. So what did happen? Well, what did happen was St. Thomas set out to teach Aristotle. Um, but this wasn't a mere tactic. What St. Thomas thought he could see uh, was the same thing that he, the Muslims and the heretics saw. That is that Aristotle provided a powerful system of thought that seems to get many of the facts right, that had impressive explanatory power, and that provided scaffolding for developing deep theological insights. Thomas thought that those three things were true of Aristotle's thought, and he wanted to show that. Uh, he thought that it could be shown, and it could be shown in a way that was faithful to Christian thought. So he began this long and vigorous intellectual career in which he penned works that were specifically aimed at showing that the heterodox conclusions didn't follow and that Aristotelian thought didn't support a distinctively Islamic theological outlook. So, for example, he writes his four-volume Summa Contra Gentiles, which was written in part to show the errors of the reasoning of those who were drawing Muslim or heterodox conclusions, and to provide a positive apologetic for the Christian faith based on Aristotelian philosophical principles. And he also undertook to write his own magnum opus, which provided a fully articulated systematic Christian theology grounded in Aristotle's metaphysics and epistemology. Now this is a painting, uh, I know it is hard to see because it's small and the room is bright, 
Uh, it's a the 15th century painting by Cazzoli called The Triumph of St. Thomas. There are many paintings from the late Middle Ages with the title The Triumph of St. Thomas and usually has St. Thomas in the center. And, um, and what you have underneath here, that's our Averroes from before. Remember, he was, looked like he was listening to the boring lecture. That's not the reason he was holding that pose. It's because he had been debunked by St. Thomas. That's what this painting is supposed to show. So when, by the time you get to the 15th century, when you get paintings like this, and Thomistic thought has really become the dominant force, or a dominant force, in, in Catholic thought, um, the triumph of St. Thomas, you might think, is complete. But that's not actually the way it happened. Which after Thomas begins his career of writing and teaching, uh, there's not a revival. There's no immediate return to orthodoxy or anything like that. And in fact, as many of you probably know, his views weren't embraced even in his own lifetime. And in fact, just three years after his death, uh, the Bishop of Paris, at the urging of the Pope, uh, once again sought to condemn certain teachings of, quote, some scholars of the arts and the faculty of theology at Paris. And um, while the targets of these condemnations are still in some dispute today, it's reasonable to infer that many of the 219 propositions that were condemned by the Bishop of Paris in 1277 were views of St. Thomas himself. So the revival didn't take place as one might have hoped, certainly if St. Thomas had hoped. Um, but the blow to St. Thomas and his work was short-lived. This is another um, painting, this one from uh, the 13th century, called The Confounding of, of Averroes, and you have uh, St. Thomas uh, holding forth uh, at the podium there, and Averroes looks like he's been knocked unconscious, uh, laying on the floor there with his books laid out in front of him. Um, the blow to St. Thomas and his work was, was short-lived. The condemnations were later lifted, and the intellectual shifts that Thomas had precipitated became instrumental in bringing about major future developments, including, so I say, although Peter might dispute, um, the scientific revolution. I think that really puts us on, a, on an important intellectual path. Um, okay, so what, why, am, why am I telling you this story? Why is this story relevant to thinking about contemporary uh, interface between science and Christian faith? And the answer is because, as in the 13th century, <clears throat> the church today faces many challenges, um, political, moral, financial, doctrinal, missional, and so on. As in the 13th century, students sometimes tend to run wild. Faculty still push the boundaries of orthodoxy. Educational institutions are still given authority to detain and punish the crimes of their students. Um, and one of the key intellectual challenges seems parallel to the challenge that they faced then from Islam and Aristotle. But today, the church isn't confronted with Aristotle, but with Darwinism. Darwinism and evolution seem to provide a challenge analogous to the challenge that the church confronted with Averroes and um, Aristotle. So like Aristotle and Islam, Darwinism we, some think, provides the intellectual scaffolding for this position, the arch, maybe the ideological arch enemy of the church, the new, new atheists. And as in the 13th century, Christians who engage Darwinism, if they're not converted to atheism, sometimes seem to reason from it to heterodox conclusions. Um, and as with the Averroes, some are trying to promote theological schizophrenia, by recommending a version of the two truth theory. I think that's what you get in Stephen Jay Gould's non-overlapping magisteria. You can have them both, right? As long as we keep them in separate buckets. Um, so we're facing something that is quite similar. But we don't have Thomas Aquinas, um, so we need a different solution. Now, I'm not saying Francis Collins is the solution, um, but uh, he, was certain, he certainly wasn't deputized by the Dominicans, and this is the best I could do. That's a, not even a Dominican robe, it's just Franciscans, but ignore that. Um, but what Francis Collins urged us all to do, and I think the organization that he founded, Biologos, and similar organizations like the Peaceful Science, founded by Josh Swamidas, what they're asking us to do is to rethink 
the conclusions that have been drawn prematurely from thinking about evolution. What they wanted to show, as Thomas wanted to show with um, uh, Aristotle, is that evolution's not best understood as the philosophical backdrop for atheism or naturalism or as the inevitable font of heterodox theology. Instead, evolution's a power the powerful framework, theoretical framework, that gets many of the facts right, that has impressive explanatory power, and that provides scaffolding for developing deep theological insights. That's the claim, anyway. So like Aquinas, what Biologos and organizations like Peaceful Science and others are aiming to show is that evolution doesn't lead to unbelief, and it doesn't need to lead to heterodoxy, but instead it paves the way to a better understanding of nature and for a theological framework that powerfully reflects and manifests the glory of God. Okay, so when I was first working on this talk, I thought, well, that's a good talk. You can just stop right there. But um, that's not good enough. And if I were in your shoes, I, that wouldn't be good enough for me either. Because you might think, oh, come on. Like, this is the talk that every heretic gives. You know, you point back to some episode in history where somebody was... Um, looking at a system of thought that seemed to have heterodox conclusions. They kind of reasoned through it, showed that it didn't have those conclusions, everything worked out fine. So no reason to worry, right? But that's not good enough because I think what I owe you is something a little more. Uh, I need to show you that in fact, the supposed heterodox conclusions don't follow, right? The summa contra gentiles. Um, and I need to show you at least, or at least gesture in the direction of some of these, what I'm calling new theological insights that emerge from this picture, if it's in fact true. So we don't have all day uh, to do this, so I'm just going to gesture at this. And, um, but of course, we have more time in Q&A and in the panel discussion if you want to follow up on any of these. So um, what are some of the supposed challenges to orthodoxy that are entailed by evolution? And I'm sure I could just have you raise your hand and you could shout them out, but um, let's instead uh, take a look at just these four, okay? So um, one is it's claimed that evolutionary thinking or Darwinism requires or leads to an affirmation of deism. A second is that it leads to denying God's role in the creation of humanity. A third is that it leads us to deny the historical Adam. And a fourth is that it leads us to affirm the existence of a creation that's driven by nature red and tooth and claw. Now, you might say, well, that wasn't my objection. Um, all right, well, you'll have to save that for the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure there's a much longer list. But I want to at least walk through these four, OK? So let's look at the first one, affirming deism. So does evolution entail, or at least make more likely, a deistic picture whereby God creates the world and is then hands off? And I think the answer to that question is absolutely not. Um, evolution does fit comfortably with the idea that God aims for biological processes to unfold according to natural laws via natural processes that God created to govern the cosmos. That's true. It does fit comfortably with that idea. But God uses natural processes unfolding via natural laws in meteorology and no one thinks that the weatherman is championing deism, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the view that God typically carries out his ends for the cosmos this way is fully consistent with his sustaining the world in existence, his displaying an imminent presence in the world, in miraculously intervening in the world. There's nothing inconsistent about that view and the belief that God miraculously intervenes in the world. Even sometimes creating new species or creating Adam and Eve de novo or uh, creating irreducibly complex structures directly if that's a view that you favor. Um, none of those things are excluded on the evolutionary picture. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't some people who adopt the label evolutionary creationism or theistic evolution who deny those things. There are. Uh, I can, we all can probably point to examples of people who hold those views, but they're not required by the evolutionary picture. So I think deism just isn't a concern. All right, second, does evolution deny God's role in the creation of humanity? And the answer to that question is also no. Uh, now, if, it, if, if there weren't distinctive theological commitments at issue here, 
I think we could just say evolutionary processes operating in their natural, natural ways yield homo sapiens and that's how it all works. But nothing about evolutionary theory requires that you take God out of the process of explaining how human beings originate, even on an evolutionary story. It's perfectly compatible with an evolutionary story that God creates evolutionary processes, that he provides them with a teleological directionality, and I'll say something about that in a minute, that he sustains these processes in existence, and even that he intervenes to cause specific events that are critical to the unfolding of the tree of life. Or that he manipulates the genome of Adam and Eve's ancestors or creates them de novo. All those things are compatible with an evolutionary story. Again, there are people who label themselves uh, theistic evolutionists who deny those things, but the view itself doesn't require a denial of those things. All right, the third. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm one slide behind. Denying the historical Adam. So, uh, does evolutionary theory require the denial of a historical Adam and Eve? And let me be, um, as you probably know, there's been a lot of discussion of this topic uh, in recent years and even more recently with the publication of Josh Swamidas' recent book. So let me be clear what I mean when I say that. Um, what I mean by that is a pair of individuals to whom all existing homo sapiens can trace their ancestry who were the first to manifest the image of God, to have morally significant freedom, and to use that morally significant freedom to sin, in virtue of which original sin uh, emerged and was transmitted to their progeny. That's what I mean by historical Adam. Is there anything about the evolutionary picture that requires that you reject those claims? And the answer to that question also seems to be no. Um, now there is good, as you may know if you follow these controversies, there's good genetic evidence that contemporary homo sapiens defended, descended from a group a few thousand years ago, numbered in, or 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, that group probably numbered in the thousands. But that evidence doesn't show that we can't also be, trace our ancestry to a pair of individuals in that community or even more recently, I think as we've seen through Josh's work on genealogical ancestry, even as recently as 10,000 years ago. So worries about the historical Adam, even though they've been widely trumpeted, even by organizations like Biologos, are premature. Right? This is one of those cases where we need to sit back and let some of the scientific findings uh, mature a little bit before we draw any premature conclusions. Okay, now the last um, concerns whether or not there's something about the biological processes of evolution that have something evil baked into them, something that Darwin called the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horribly cruel works of nature. Uh, is there something inconsistent about an evolutionary process that seems to have these features with the creation being the creation of a holy good God? Or creation is described in the text of Genesis. So <clears throat> um, I think before we tackle this question, this was a question that I addressed in the uh, a book that I wrote a few years ago, um, which I didn't, if you've read this book or if you've seen it or if you know anything about it, the book wasn't really intended to answer the question. It was intended to provide a variety of answers to the question that different Christians, I think, can adopt based on certain theological convictions that they might have. So Christians attempting to give an account of God's permission of evil in general, not just in an evolutionary context, not just natural evil, typically do so by providing some kind of reasonable account, a reasonable story that explains how the permission of those evils are necessary for some greater good. So the question we need to ask is, what goods arise from allowing evolutionary evil that couldn't be secured from a system without or with less pain, suffering, predation, extinction, the sorts of things that we think attend the evolutionary process. Now, that's not an easy question to answer. Young Earth creationists think that there is no answer to that question. New atheists think there's no answer to that question. So in this regard, they share that belief in common. So are they right about that? Is there no way, no way to answer this question? But let's be, I wanna break this down a little bit further. because I think there are four different kinds of questions we can ask in this space of uh, the problem of evil as it manifests itself in, um, in creation more broadly 
and in the evolutionary picture in particular. So here are four questions. Why does God permit animals to experience pain and suffering? How can we explain the reality of pain and suffering if it's not a consequence of the fall? Is animal pain and suffering an intrinsic feature of an evolving creation? And last, what goods come from permitting the animal suffering we find in the evolutionary picture? That is, what goods which could justify God's permission of that suffering? Okay, so I want to run through these quickly. So first, why does God permit animals to experience pain and suffering? I mean, the first thing to say about this is this is not a question that's distinctive of the evolutionary position. Right? Every position holds that there are, any position that holds that there are non-human animals and that those non-human animals experience pain and suffering have to deal with this question. So whether you're a young earth creationist or an advocate of ID or an old earth or whoever you are, this is an important question in theodicy. You need to address it but it's not distinctive of an evolutionary position. Second question, <clears throat> how can we explain the reality of pain and suffering if it's not a consequence of the fall? Now, this question has a certain presumption behind it that I think we need to interrogate carefully. And the assumption is that the fall would be a good explanation for the evil that we find in the natural world. So, the idea here is something like this. Since on the evolutionary view, lots of animal pain and suffering occurs before any humans are around, we need an explanation for the origins of animal pain and suffering because we can't rely on the fall, which otherwise would be a good explanation. And I think the first thing to say about that is we don't often pause and think long and hard enough about whether or not the fall is in fact a good explanation for animal pain and suffering. So remember that the goal is to give an explanation a morally sufficient reason for God to permit some evil to occur. That's what we do when we're thinking about questions of theodicy and the problem of evil more generally. An explanation where permitting some evil is necessary for bringing about some outweighing good. Right? So what is it on the fall account? What is this, what is this greater good that's supposed to uh, explain the permission of the fall? What's the greater good that's supposed to explain the permission of the fall? Now, typically the answer is it's free will. That is that God gave Adam and Eve free will and that they misused that freedom and that as a result, all sorts of evil permeate out through the creation, including natural evil, including animal suffering. But the strange thing about that view, the undefend, what I'm calling the undefended assumption is what would explain God's making the creation in a way that's so fragile Right? On, this, on this story, the integrity of nature hangs on the moral uprightness of a pair of, of hominids. Their doing wrong has these cataclysmic consequences that ripple out across the creation. But why is that a good feature of a creation? That it have this sort of, what I'm calling fragility, where the wrongdoing of this pair has such catastrophic consequences for so many millions and billions of innocent creatures. If we're going to rely on the fall theodicy. We need to think through that. We need to have a good answer to that question. And I don't think there are good answers to that question. So I think the fall is not a good explanation for animal suffering after all. That doesn't mean we don't need another. It doesn't mean we don't need an explanation. But I think what it shows is that everybody needs one. And we'll have to provide one in the context of evolutionary thinking as well. And we'll get to that in the fourth question. Okay, so the third question, is animal pain and suffering an intrinsic feature of an evolving creation or extinction or predation or all these other features of um, the evolutionary story that we think of as having some kind of negative connotation? And we could spend a long time on this and I don't have time to do that. So I'm just gonna say some things very quickly that if you wanna follow up in Q&A, we can do that. But the short version of the answer to the question is no. So there's nothing about the evolutionary picture that requires animal pain and suffering, or even death and predation. Um, those features are features that are required of a, um, a natural environment that's finite. So when you have a finite space within which life can develop, you need things like death and extinction because you need replacement. There are finite resources that can be deployed. If we had an infinite space on which life could evolve, there wouldn't be any need for those things. Organisms wouldn't need to die. Organisms wouldn't even necessarily need to eat one another. Um, they could continue to spread out infinitely, but we don't have that. We have a finite space. So one question we need to ask ourselves is, well, why do we have a finite space on which life can evolve? 
And the answer to that question is probably because the universe needs to be fine-tuned in a certain way for life to emerge, and that fine-tuning seems to require that we inhabit finite spaces. That's a very abbreviated uh, account, I understand. Uh, I'd be happy to say more about it later. But I think it at least takes the, um, uh, the, the punch out of the claim that somehow there's something about evolution itself which requires these intrinsically bad features and that that's the reason why we should resist adopting the view that it's God's mode of creating the complexity and diversity of life. Okay, and the last, so what good could come from permitting the kind of animal suffering we find in evolutionary processes? What should we think about that? And there's been a lot written on this, and frankly, I, a lot of it I find very unpersuasive. I think many of the accounts that have been given about the uh, explanations of animal pain and suffering in the context of theodicy are, um, are flawed. I'm just gonna give you one example, and it's one that I'm gonna give you because I, I hear it uh, repeated often. And so on this increasingly a popular position, I think, um, natural evil isn't caused by moral evil as we have on the fall, right? There's something about the, the wrongdoing, the free wrongdoing on the part of Adam and Eve that leads to this pervasive natural evil. On this view, uh, natural evil is caused in an analogous way where creation itself, like human beings, is supposed to have something that those who um, defend this view call a freedom to wander. Creation itself has a freedom to wander. And that leaves it open to the possibility that it wanders in directions that involve natural evil. So John Polkinghorn, who's one of the defenders of this view, says, God has created this amazing universe so that life can evolve and come into being, endowed with the true freedom required for love, this entails giving a certain amount of freedom to the physical processes and a process of creative destruction via evolution. And this is a view that's defended also by Francis uh, Collins and Carl Guyberson in their book, The Language of Science and Faith, and by others as well. Um, but there are problems with this view. Um, so let me just mention three quickly. First of all, despite the label, um, at least I would argue, the non-conscious creation isn't free. It might have contingent features. It might have features that are unpredictable. And certainly those things are true of events that are free or caused by free agents. But that's not what freedom is. And to claim otherwise is just mistakenly anthropomorphic. Um, second of all, there's reason to think that a free cosmos could have been created which permits, permits less suffering than is actual. So if all you need for this free creation is contingency and unpredictability, that itself doesn't entail that you're going to get a creation that has as much what we would call natural evil as we find in the present world. And third, even if one and two can, even if we can resolve those, um, you have to ask yourself this question. Is the good of a free cosmos does that outweigh the massive suffering that it's supposed to justify on this account? Think of all of the natural evil and the suffering that accrues to the creatures that experience that natural evil. Is that outweighed by the good of a free cosmos? I mean, some obviously think so, I, I, but I just find that implausible. Okay, so what other sorts of explanations could there be for the permission of the kinds of pain and suffering we find for um, animals in the evolutionary picture. And I'll give you three fairly quickly. Uh, first I'll call the greater goods explanation, the second I'm gonna call the embodied intentionality explanation, the third I'll call the chaos to order explanation. So on the first, um, there are just certain greater goods that accrue in a universe that allows animals to experience these pain and sufferings, uh, experience this sort of pain and suffering. So for example, Richard Swinburne says that this allows animals to engage in actions of great moral significance. So a mother is protecting her young um, is something that it has moral significance because she does so in the face of threats of certain kinds of pain and suffering. And to do that carries a sort of nobility that gives non-human animals a kind of great moral significance. And that increases the goodness of God's creation. Now here's a second. Some argue, like the, there was a book recently published by Trent Doherty, which makes this claim, that somehow the uh, possibility of pain and suffering in their terrestrial life makes it possible for animals, non-human animals, to engage in a kind of soul-making. Soul-making that develops traits of character that allow them to have a greater appreciation for God in the eschaton in some way. 
Um, again, we could spend a long time talking about these views. I'll just say quickly, I find both of those positions implausible. Um, I think the first one because while it's true that being at risk might allow the, the mother to uh, ha display actions that have some sort of moral significance, it's not the possibility of pain and suffering that gives those actions significance, it's the possibility of loss. Right? It's the risk of her, say, death at protecting her young that gives it that significance. So does it explain the reality of pain and suffering? That, that I don't see. Um, when it comes to soul making for non-human animals, I find that implausible as an explanation, at least if it's tended to extend across all of those animals that are capable of experiencing pain and suffering. Uh, others might not agree with that conclusion. Uh, we can certainly talk about it more later. But I think here are a couple of others. So the first is what I'm calling embodied intentionality. So the following seems to be um, true when it comes to embodied intentional agents like us, intentional agents that have bodies, unlike, say, angels. Um, when embodied creatures are created to act on certain intentions, there must be some mechanism that allows them to weigh the good of achieving certain desired ends against the ills of an injury. So this is somebody who's engaged in fire walking. Right? So when, when we have bodies and we act freely, we, we act on the basis of intentions. Right? We, want to, we want to accomplish some end. And when that's the case, we need to have some mechanism that says, accomplishing this end is causing you harm and injury. You need to stop doing that. Or at least you need to weigh the costs of incurring this injury against achieving the goal you're trying to achieve. Some mechanism has to be in place that allows us to, to do that, um, to, to engage in this balancing act. So um, what is that? Well, it looks like the mechanism that we have for uh, this trade-off, or this, this, what I'm calling the countervailing source of motivation when we're at the risk of injury, is pain. That's the thing that tells us if you're gonna continue down this path, you're going to incur significant injury, so you only should do it if you're sure that it's worth it. And you know, many of you I, I know are familiar with the work of, um, of Paul Brand that was made famous in the work by a book by Philip Yancey, The Gift of Pain, where what they were trying to do was to find a, an alternative way of having people be protected against physical injury when they lost the ability to feel pain in their peripheral digits. Right? And there's this one very telling part of the book where um, Dr. Brand develops these pressure-sensitive gloves. You remember this? And so they, he develops these pressure-sensitive gloves, and what it does is it delivers a shock to the person's underarm, because one of the few places where those with Hansen's disease don't lose their ability to feel pain is in their underarms. So they wired it up so that it would give them a, a shock there. And so there's this one video that they have of this guy who's trying to repair a motorcycle, right? And he's trying to get this, um, a nut off of a bolt using a wrench. Right? And he's pushing really hard. And you can see that he gets a shock, right? Because he's pushing too hard. And so it's causing pressure in the glove. And he does it again, and he gets the shock. And so what does he do? Does he stop? No, he reaches up under, grabs the thing, pulls the electrodes off of his underarm, and then right, finishes the job. So um, we can talk for a long time about the psychology of pain and, and avoidance of noxious stimulus. But that's some evidence of thinking that when you have intentional agents, you need some painful, non-optional right, way of registering damage, bodily damage, if you're going to be able to survive in a physical world. All right, there's a third option I want to talk about what I call chaos to order, but let me come back to it. I want to say one thing about the theological insights that might emerge from evolutionary thinking. And um, before I start, let's, let me point out that you know, throughout the history of the Christian church, Christian theology, um, discussions of providence have kind of two valences to them. So on the one hand, there's discussions about divine providence when it comes to uh, providentially superintending the activities of free agents, free creatures. Um, when we talk about um, uh, issues of predestination and election, we're thinking about God's providence over those sorts of things. But there's another set of literature that deals with God's providence over nature. And Discussions about these two wax and wane over the course of theological history, and discussions of natural providence are especially prominent when big scientific revolutions are underway. So in the 17th century with the mechanistic revolution, in the 19th century with Darwin, in the 20th century with Einstein, you see 
um, Christian thinkers, philosophers and theologians and scientists reflecting on God's providential superintending of the natural world. Um, so during the mechanical revolution in the 17th century, what you find is that Christians are proposed, many Christians are proposing this model of natural providence where God orchestrates the conditions of nature to achieve his ends through creatures' law-governed display of their powers. The, this is the clockwork universe picture, right, where God is cast as the perfect engineer or the perfect craftsman or the perfect architect. And so Robert Boyle, you will never be able to read this next slide because the text is way too small, but let me read it for you. Robert Boyle you know, describes natural providence in this way. Proponents of the pre-mechanical philosophy, pre 16th, 17th century philosophy, he says, seem to imagine the world to be after the nature of a puppet whose contrivance indeed may be very artificial, but yet is such that almost every particular motion of the artificer, artificer is fain to guide and oftentimes overrule the actions of the engine. Whereas according to us, it's like a rare clock, such as maybe at Strasbourg, where all things are skillfully contrived to that engine being once set in motion all things proceed according to the artificer's first design and the motions of the little statues that at such hours perform these or those things do not require, like those of the puppets, the particular interposing of the artificer or any intelligent agent employed by them, but perform their functions upon the particular occasions by virtue of the general and primitive contrivance of the whole engine, right? The great clockwork universe. So this language wasn't often used to describe the biological domain at this particular period, but in the wake of Darwin, you start to see the same language used about the biological world. So here's a quote from arguably the most famous preacher from the late 19th century, Henry Ward Beecher, who says this, if the single acts of creation would evince design, how much more a vast universe that by inherent laws gradually builds itself and then creates its own plants and animals, a universe so adjusted that it left by the way the poorest things and steadily wrought towards more complex, ingenious, and beautiful results. Who designed this mighty machine, created matter, gave its laws, and impressed upon it that tendency which has brought forth the almost infinite results on the globe and wrought them into a perfect system? Of course, he thinks that's the creator. And coming at the time of the Industrial Revolution, it wasn't surprising to see many comparing the evolutionary process to something like the automated processes of manufacturing. So with apologies for the sexism of the next quote, which is not mine, it's Beecher's. He says, well, it's a beautiful design, and these are skillful women that made it. There can be no question about that. He's talking about rugs, manufacturing of rugs. But now behold the power loom where not simply a rug with long drudging work by hand is being created, but where the machine is creating, creating carpet in endless lengths. Now the question is, is it an evidence of design in these women that they turn out such rugs? Of course. And is it not evidence of a higher design in the man, that's the sexist part, who, who turned out that machine, which could carry on this work a thousandfold ma more magnificently than human fingers did? Right? So we get this picture of the evolutionary processes like the power loom. So there's something about this created order that moves from chaos to order in the biological world through law-like means. It speaks to the order and design of creation. That's the picture that Beecher wants to uh, paint for us. And so what you get, this is a picture of the evolution of the tree of life. What you get perhaps brings us back to that third solution that I mentioned concerning the origins and explanation of animal pain and suffering on evolution. Perhaps the explanation goes something like this. It's a great good for the creation to yield creatures that are made in the image of God. That's the goal. And it's a good thing for that to happen by way of a, chaos, a cosmos that moves from chaos to order by law-like means. That's the clockwork universe picture. And if that's right, then maybe it's necessary that the biological world pass through these intermediate stages where you have organisms with increasing types and degrees of mental capacities, including precursors to our ability to consciously feel pain and suffering. So that's just part of the natural trajectory. But even, even beyond this general, this general framework, the chaos to order, clockwork universe picture that applies to the biological realm as well, um, 
we see other signs of God's activity and care and providence and design in the world when we approach it through an evolutionary lens. And let me just close with two examples of that. So the first is evolutionary convergence. Um, so what happens with evolutionary convergence is that there are certain phenomena that seems to arise over and over again in unrelated uh, organisms or organisms that are distantly related. This includes things like body plans or coloration, organs, and so on. And in one sense, when we first discovered the notion of convergence, it seemed like a surprise because what you find is sometimes these very complex structures emerge over and over again. So, you know, Charles Hodge famously thought that the uh, evolution of the eye uh, couldn't be explained by Darwinism, Darwinism because it was just so complex. How could, it, how could it appear? And how could it appear over and over again? But what we know now is that the eye appears in the octopus and the squid and in human beings, organisms that on the evolutionary picture have a very, very different evolutionary trajectory. And we see that with winged flight in mammals and reptiles and birds. We see it in patterns of coloration in birds and snakes and other organisms in very different parts of the, of the world, which have no or very little evolutionary relatedness. Um, why does that happen? Well, the answer is because there are certain persistent challenges in the environment. And there are certain good evolutionary solutions to those challenges. And so natural selection tends to push organisms in the direction of these good solutions to environmental challenges. And so it leads one to think, well, maybe the way God exercises providence over the, over the biological world is by creating these kinds of evolutionary guardrails that push organisms down particular evolutionary paths. So fish and cetaceans, for example, two very distant, different lines, phyletic lines in, um, in the biological world, show similar body plans, coloration patterns, neutral buoyancy. These things seem to evolve over and over again because they're good solutions to persistent environmental challenges. And so perhaps God has configured the natural world to push the biological um, world in particular directions, directions that lead to the origins of organisms that manifest the divine image. And if you think that, then what you want to do as a Christian who's a biologist is ask, what are those evolutionary constraints? What are those environmental constraints? Do they, in fact, point in the direction of something that shows us God's aims for creation? And there are works of some Christian thinkers that have um, gone looking for these evolutionary constraints based on these sorts of theological convictions. And in fact, it looks like we're finding some. So you might think it shows that there's a kind of evolutionary fine tuning, not of the sort you find in intelligent design, but in terms of these environmental constraints. Okay, one last example, and this is something that many of you may be familiar with, and that is some recent fascinating work on the evolution of religion and religious belief. So as you go across times and cultures, you find that everywhere you go, human beings are religious. And secular scientists find this puzzling because they don't know how to explain how this phenomenon can emerge over and over again in these very different lines. How do we explain that? So here's one explanation. You might say, well, look, there is a spiritual reality. We all have the ability to sense that spiritual reality. Some of us see it more clearly. Those of us who are redeemed see it even more clearly, but those who don't see through a glass darkly. And so what, what we do is we see spiritual reality as best we can. And we kind of build our, our theological systems around them. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes because of the fall, we get it wrong. But that doesn't seem very plausible, or at least adherents of different religious traditions don't explain the origins of their beliefs that way. It's not as if they're experiencing some spiritual reality and they build this edifice around it. It happens in some other way, just sort of naturally we seem to fall into these beliefs. And that's in fact what recent work in empirical psychology about religion seems to show. And evolutionary theorists have um, then begun to look at this problem and ask, well, are there evolutionary pressures that might push homo sapiens in the direction of forming these religious beliefs? And there are actually some really interesting and intriguing hypotheses that seem to answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, there are good evolutionary reasons why we would, we would evolve these dispositions to believe in the existence of God. So one very popular hypothesis these days, sometimes called the supernatural punishment hypothesis, where human beings that have formed these dispositions to believe in the existence of invisible moralizing agents are better able to cooperate with one another and therefore are more likely to uh, survive. So in other words, 
If you believe that you get what's coming to you and that God's in control, that's, a, that's adaptive from an evolutionary point of view. And therefore, we, we, that's the explanation for why we see this, uh, these religious beliefs coming to be across times and cultures. And as I said, there's some good evidence for this. I'm running short on time, so I won't be able to talk about that, this particular slide. Um, but I think one of the interesting implications of this is that when you look at passages like Romans 1, 19 and 20, Rather than seeing this passage as affirming that there's kind of bits of evidence in the cosmos from which we infer the existence of God, we can read passages like this as teaching us that God has designed us so that we naturally form these beliefs in God, in supernatural reality, that evolutionary processes have wired us to do this, and the only way we can avoid it is by culpably resisting these natural tendencies that we have. Okay. So let me bring this to a conclusion, back to where we started with Galileo moments. So as I said, some say that the church is at a Galileo moment. And when they say that, they mean something like the, ev the evidence is now becoming so overwhelming, you know, the dam of resistance is about to break and the church has nothing uh, left to do but to sort of accept this as the true position when it comes to our biological origins. But some Christian thinkers have resisted using this phrase of Galilean moment, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read you this because you won't be able to see it. This comes from Jamie Smith. It was in an article in Christianity Today a few years ago. And he says something I think is really prudent. It's this. There's a particular analogy often invoked in current discussions about the relationship between Christian faith and science. Ours, we are told, is a Galileo moment, a critical time in history when new findings in the natural sciences threatened to topple fundamental Christian beliefs, just as Galileo proposed heliocentrism rocked the ecclesiastical establishment of his day. This parallel is usually invoked in the context of the genetic, evolutionary, and archaeological evidence about human origins that challenge traditional Christian understandings. Historical analogies like this are often particularly loaded because of our, our age is characterized by chronological snobbery and a self-congratulatory sense of our maturity and progress. Since we now tend to look at the church's response to Galileo's misguided, reactionary, and backward, this Galilean framing of contemporary discussions does two things before any evidence is put on the table. First, it casts Christian scientists and those scholars who champion such science as heroes and martyrs, willing to embrace progress and enlightenment. And second, as a result, this framing of the debate depicts those concerned with preserving Christian orthodoxy as backward, timid, and fundamentalists, with heads in the flat earth sand. Any who voice hesitation or skepticism about the assured obvious implications of evolutionary evidence are cast in the villainous role of Galileo's putative prosecutor, Cardinal Bellarmine. And there's something right about that characterization, and we should resist that. So I suggest we pivot away from Galilean moments, and we talk about Thomas moments, um, a notion that maybe gestures towards the skepticism of the Apostle Thomas, who had to put his hand uh, on the uh, wounded Christ to, uh, to have his belief uh, strengthened. A Thomas moment isn't when one, isn't when one embraces uh, the backward church and is brought reluctantly to embrace some kind of empirical challenge to faith, but where we aim to bring every thought captive to Christ by showing ourselves and the world that faith can be articulated through a lens that many think either entails atheism or heterodoxy.